<laughs> All right, let me get my content up there. Where we begin? All right, we were talking about um, chapter 3 and the idea of birth, the physical idea, the spiritual idea, being born from above, enabling us to see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and as Brother Jeremiah pointed out to us earlier, uh, John continues to talk about the effects of being born of God all the way through First John. But John, Gospel of, chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, is certainly connected to this. <clears throat> as many as received him, that is, received Jesus, to them gave he power to be children of God, even to those that believe on his name who were born, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. <clears throat> so born of God is the same thing as being born from above, God being the source of that new birth. So Nicodemus doesn't get it. He says, how shall I be born when I'm old? Shall I enter my mother's womb a second time and be born? He's taking the, the literal. Now, you see, the, you see Nicodemus' statement? Compare Nicodemus' statement with chapter 2, verse 20 where um, the people say, this temple took 46 years to build. You're going to raise it up in three days? Compare that question to John chapter 3, verse 4, where Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? <clears throat> you see, in both cases, the question is a question from somebody who's focused on the literal, the physical, and uh, instead of being focused on the spiritual, which John is trying to convey, which Jesus is trying to convey. <clears throat> so Jesus answers him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, if we look at this on the, um, <clears throat> the screen here just a minute. I've got my brand new Bible, which I like that y'all gave me. And let's widen out just a little bit. All right. Notice here I've been marking down all the places where he talked about being born, born from above, born when he is old. Born, <clears throat> born of water and spirit. Notice there really isn't a art, an article on the spirit. Born of water and spirit is what it says. <clears throat> born of spirit. Uh, I think certainly we're talking about from above. And he talks about this in just a moment again. Uh, he, he mentions this down in verse 7. To be born anothen from above. And then a little bit later in, what is it, verse 8? He says, so is he that is born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. <clears throat> now think about this. Born of the Spirit here. Born from above here. Born of water and spirit here. Uh, earlier, born from above up here. Then back in chapter 1, verse 13, born of God. So you've got born of God, born from above, born of the spirit, born of water and spirit. <clears throat> I think all of these are describing the same thing. And certainly from, from verse 5, uh, the early people who interpreted this passage certainly took this as a reference to baptism, at least the water parts. 
But um, certainly there's more to this than just getting dunked in some water. This is something that originates from God, as we talked about in the book of uh, 1 John. Uh, we talked about um, the fact in 1 John 3, verse 9. Uh, let everybody turn to 1 John 3, 9 again real quick. <clears throat> 1 John 3, 9. It says, Everyone that is born of God does not continue to sin. Why? Because his seed remains in him. And the word seed there is sperma, S-P-E-R-M-A. So his seed remains in him. Whose seed? God's seed. The seed of the Spirit. <clears throat> so God plants his seed, his word, in us. And that seed creates a new being if that seed is implanted deep in a human mind. And as long as that seed remains in us, we cannot live a lifestyle of sin. See? So John develops this further in the, in the book of 1 John. <clears throat> so, born of water and the Spirit. Born from above. You can't see the kingdom of God unless you do this. You can't enter the kingdom of God unless you do this. And then he clearly contrasts the two kinds of birth in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. See, that's birth with a little b. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So to become a spiritual being, to become a, a, a something more than carnal, <clears throat> we have to have the seed of God planted in us and we have to be transformed into that spiritual being. Yes, Brother Jeremiah. <clears throat> Big S or little s? Which one? Uh, when it says that which is born of the Spirit. Um, oh, I think, I think that's a big S. Okay, why would it not... Um, Whenever it says born of flesh and then born of spirit, I, I'm, I'm seeing that as like contrast. Like it is. Walking flesh and walking after the spirit. <clears throat> yeah, but it has, it has the article with it this time. But it has the article with the flesh, too. Yeah. Does that make no, the it, flesh something special? No, but see... What's the source of the birth if we follow from chapter 1, verse 13? Born of God. God, yes. Chapter 1, verse 13. That's what makes you capitalize it. Born from above. What, what's the source of the birth from above? Well, it's God. Yes. Born of the Spirit. <clears throat> now then, um, we're gonna we're gonna talk more about the spirit as we as we go along in this um, in this book, but I think they're legitimate in capitalizing it here. <clears throat> okay. All so right. The Holy so Spirit is, what, is what does the work in redemption. Here. Yeah, and the Holy Spirit is what does the work in transformation. Okay, Through, that makes sense. Yep. So um, a a fleshly being is the product of a fleshly birth. A spiritual being is the product of a spiritual birth. And so God has to get involved in this birth. Heaven has to get involved in this birth for it to be uh, spiritual. So the outward act of the water is important because God said so, but not it doesn't affect a new birth without the spirit being active in it as well. <clears throat> so he says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born from above. And then you have to see this in the original to get the point in, in verse 8. He, he's using a play on words here in verse 8. So you, you have 
in verse 8, the wind, right? Mm-hmm. But look at, look at the screen there in green. Say so, yeah, the spirit. So the same the same word for for uh, spirit and wind. So the pneuma, the pneuma blows. See even the word for blows, like the wind blowing. Look at the word here. P N E A. The wind, the pneuma blows, and you hear the sound of it. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it came from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the pneumatos, pneuma. So you got pneuma here and you got pneuma here. So he's, he's been talking about that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. See? And then he says the pneuma. So he's using the word wind to, to illustrate how the spirit works. And what he's saying in verse 8 is you can't see the Spirit, but you can see the effects of the Spirit. Just like you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. When the trees are moving, that's, that's the trees moving. You're not seeing the wind. You're seeing the effects of the wind. When you hear a sound, it's not the wind. It's uh, the, the leaves brushing together and the branches creaking. That's what you hear. It's the grass brushing on each other. That's what you hear. But you do not see or hear the wind, but you see what the wind does. So the one who is born of God practices righteousness. You see it, see the effects. The one who is born of God loves, 1 John 4, 7. The one who is born of God does not continue in sin. You see the effects of the pneuma, but you don't see the pneuma. Okay? Yes, sir, Brother Jeremiah. <clears throat> Could Jesus be referencing the the works that he does by the power of the Spirit as well? Probably not here because he's talking about this personal birth. Except a man be born from above. He's talking about something that happens in the individual. All right. So, of course... We remember this one from chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, born of God, similar to born of the Spirit. But who is it that is born of God? Well, if you look at verse 12 here on the screen, it's those that receive Jesus. It's those that believe on Jesus. Those are the people that are going to be transformed. So the process of accepting Jesus, the process of believing in Jesus, results in this heavenly rebirth because you can't believe on Jesus and accept Jesus unless you've accepted his word into your heart and been convicted and converted by it see so <clears throat> it's those who believe Jesus those that receive Jesus those are the ones who are born so it's it's the welcoming Jesus into your life is what causes this new birth this birth from God all right, so we, we've gone through these in 1 John, but just to review you, you got your 1 John 2.29, everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. <clears throat> and then you've got your 1 John 3.9, you don't keep practicing sin if you're born of Him. See, this is what you can see in the life of a person. You got your 1 John 4, 7, and 8, which says you're you're going to exhibit love if you're born of God. 1 John 4, 7, and 8. 1 John 4, or 1 John 5, 1, you're going to believe that Jesus is the Christ. And you're not only going to love God, but you're going to love those that are born of God, if you're born of God.
This is similar to 1 John 3, 9, 1 John 5, 18, but all of these are references in 1 John to the effects of the new birth. <clears throat> what can we observe in the lives of people who are born again? All right. So Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Now, <clears throat> I think what John is doing is saying to his readers, the Jews, the teachers of Israel, are not grasping these spiritual ideas. See, they're, they're wanting to keep you on the surface. They're wanting to keep you on the mundane, literal level. But he says, truly, truly, I say to you, we, talking about Jesus and company, we speak things that we know. We bear witness of that which we have seen. See, Jesus came from heaven. And he came to earth, so he, he's seen heavenly things, and he's telling about heavenly things. But he says, you all, and it's a plural you here, you all do not receive our witness. Well, you all is the Jews. It's like I've got this good friend that I've had for years, and he's an African-American preacher, and he he's, preaches for an African-American congregation predominantly. And uh, I say, uh, Brother Roe, how do you all say this? And he knows exactly what I'm talking about, see. And, and he says to me, well, how do you all say it? You know, and I know exactly what he's talking about. So when Jesus says this, you know, you all don't receive our testimony. He means you Jews. And in the perspective of um, the book of John, the Jews, which makes no sense if we're really running a film in the time of Jesus because everybody in the film was Jews. But in John, he uses the Jews to describe those that rejected Jesus. See? So he says, you all do not accept our testimony. Well, the gospel of John itself is a testimony. See? See? So then he says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will, I be how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And see, this should be our clue that Jesus is trying to talk about heavenly things. Now, were we supposed to be looking for heavenly things back there in that story about the temple and destroying this temple and I'll build it in three days? Or should we have been focused on earthly things right there? What about in the story of uh, water and wine? Should we be looking for heavenly things or earthly things? See, it becomes very clear in John's Gospel that if you're focused on earthly things, all you can see is light with a little L. But you can't grasp the true light. All you can see is bread, but you can't grasp the true bread that came down out of heaven. All you can see is vines, but you can't understand the true vine. See? And so, this verse is really important in the whole Gospel of John. And it, it's asking the reader, basically, are you going to be focused on the earthly things? Or are you going to open yourself up to accept heavenly things, spiritual things? So Jesus says, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. <clears throat> so who can tell you about heavenly things except somebody who's come down from heaven? <clears throat> now, it's... it's um, then Jesus says a really strange thing here which, again, is very allegorical. It's very spiritual. If you go back to Numbers, Book of Numbers, uh, chapter 21. <clears throat> Numbers 21. Everybody just go back there and let's read it together. 
Jeremiah, read Numbers 21, starting 4, read down through verse 9, please, sir. Yes, sir. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord, that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on the standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if a serpent, a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Now the that's, a, bit- that's good. That's, that's a weird story. <clears throat> now, these serpents... Uh, bit the people because they rebelled against God and they, the, the serpents were their punishment. They, they meant death, see? So he's comparing Jesus lifted up to the serpent lifted up. See, Moses puts this brass snake on a, on a standard, on a pole, and he lifts it up high so everybody can look at it, see it. And he says, all right, you rebellious Israelites, God's going to forgive you. If you'll fix your eyes on that serpent, God will heal you of your snake bite and you'll live. But notice what Jesus says here in verse 14. Just as, and it, it may be John actually that's commenting here in verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the, spe- the serpent in the desert, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, why did Moses lift up the serpent? Because the only way those people were going to be healed of their snake bite and live was to be able to look at that serpent. So he lifted it up high. And they had to focus their attention on that serpent in order to be healed. So Christ must be lifted up so that we can focus the attention of our life on Jesus. we got to have our attention on Jesus. See, there's a lot of things that want us to be focused on them in this world. But if you want to live, if you want to be cured, if you don't want to die, you need to focus your life on that lifted up Son of Man. Now, let's look up, Legrange, look up 828 for me. And Brother Ben, if you would look up 1232 for me. 828 and 1232. Parker, what does 828 say? Jesus therefore said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing out of my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. All right. When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. Notice, lift up. Okay, go to 1232, Brother Ben. And I... If I am lifted up from the earth, it will draw all men to myself. One more verse. Uh, but he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. All right, so the lifting up refers to being lifted up on the cross. <clears throat> so, we've got to focus our attention on the crucified Jesus if we want to live. Just like those rebellious Israelites needed to focus their attention on that serpent lifted up on that standard, we've got to focus our attention on the crucified Son of Man if we're going to live. All right? So, starting with verse 14, um, it's very difficult in here if if you're reading this to tell where Jesus' talk with Nicodemus ends and John's comments begin. But my opinion, for what it's worth, and it doesn't mean a thing, you'll have to study it for yourself. My opinion is that Jesus' comments to Nicodemus end in verse 13, and John the Apostle is explaining beginning in verse 14, where he says, 
Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes may in him have eternal life. And then when we read, um, and you notice that you have believe and eternal life, like you have in the purpose statement at the end of the gospel. You know, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. <clears throat> verse 16, which is our favorite verse of all time for everybody, see, is really an explanation of verse 14 and 15. See, how is it? In what way is it true that uh, just like Moses lifted up the serpent, everyone must, uh, the Son of Man will be lifted up so that everyone who believes may in him have eternal life. Why is that true? For, say the for goes back to verse 14 and 15. Here's why it's true. For God so loved the world. Notice the way verse, 15, verse 16 is worded. It's already past tense. It's already a done deal. God so loved the world that he gave... His only begotten Son. See, this is John talking, looking back at the death of Christ. God so loved the world that He gave His unique Son so that whoever... Now, let's dissect this a little bit. God so loved that He gave. Well, if you, if you go back to 1 John 3.16, <clears throat> this is how we even know what love is. Because he laid down his life for us. So how did God love? He so loved that he gave his only son. All right. What did he love? He loved the world. The world. Well, if, if you go back to John 1 verse 10 at the end, the world did not know him. So the world is the ones that don't know God, but God so in this way, to this degree, he loved the world, the ones that didn't know God. <clears throat> um, write down beside verse 16, John 15, 19. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, since you are not of the world, and I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So the world hates Jesus and hates his disciples. And when we come to Jesus, we're no longer in the world. See, but God loved the world, the lost, the ones that didn't know Jesus. He loved to the point that he gave his only son. Why did he love and give? That. See, that's a henna clause. That's so that. So that. Uh, so that everyone who believes. Well, who are those that believe? If you go back to chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name who were born. So receiving Jesus is the same as believing on Jesus is the same as being born. So why did God love and give so that whoever believes? See, he loved and gave to make it possible so that everyone who believes in him, in Christ, should not perish. See, like they, were, they would have died of snake bite, and we will perish in our sins. Um, where is it? John 8... 28, maybe, somewhere around there. Unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. Maybe it's 824, somewhere in that neighborhood. <clears throat> Unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. <clears throat> so, He gave so that whoever believes should not perish, but should have eternal life. But we're not talking about just death by snake bite. We're talking about eternal death, and spiritual life. Um, in John chapter um, 
5, verse 24. Write this down. John 5, 24. Everyone who hears my words and believes him that sent me has, present tense, eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. So, <clears throat> this eternal life is spiritual life. It's life in fellowship with God. And God loved and gave so that believers would not perish. They would not die in their sins. But they would have this fellowship with God, this eternal life, this spiritual life, both now and forevermore. <clears throat> in the Gospel of John, notice I'm not saying everywhere, every place, <clears throat> but in the Gospel of John, eternal basically means spiritual. Eternal is not emphasizing so much duration as it is emphasizing an otherworldly quality, a different quality. In other words, spiritual as opposed to fleshly. Eternal life, heavenly life, spiritual life. And in John's writings, if you don't have eternal life right now, you're not going to have it later either. <clears throat> All right, so John is expounding on this, on this thing and explaining the whole plan of God in Christ for a minute to the, to the reader, see? And then he's going to come back and, and tell him some more things that happened with Jesus. For God did not send the Son into the world to, I would translate this, to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. See, God loved the world, verse 16, and sent the Son to save the world. The mission of the Son was not to condemn the world. The mission of the Son was to save the world. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. So he came to save, not to condemn. That's why the Son of Man must be lifted up, see? <clears throat> then John continues here. He said, who, he who believes in him is not condemned. It doesn't mean he won't go to be judged before the throne of God. He means he's not condemned. The word crino sometimes means to decide and sometimes it means to condemn somebody. And in this passage, it means to condemn. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe in him has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So if you reject Christ, you're <coughs> condemned. See, you, you might as you built... You might as well be like those Israelites that were snake bitten and they refused to look upon the brass serpent that was lifted up. They're, they're going to die. And the, the only hope is the Son of Man that's lifted up. <clears throat> so the whole gospel was written that you may believe and that as you believe, you may have life through his name. This is your, this is your word that I'm translating condemned here instead of judged. And this is the condemnation. In other words, this is the reason why they're condemned. Verse 19. Because the light has come into the world. Now, if, if you go back right there in that verse, go back to chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, where it says, John the Baptist was not that light, but he came to bear witness to the light. Verse 9, Jesus was the true light that enlightens every man coming into the world. So, light of the world, you step down into darkness. That's what we're talking about right here. So this is the judgment that the light came into the world, and men loved the darkness 
rather <laughs> than the light. See, they didn't want to accept the light because their deeds were evil. They wanted to stay in the darkness. That's why they're condemned. For everyone who does evil, everyone who practices evil. Now see, that's a John phrase because um, in, in First John you either practice evil or you practice righteousness. See? Everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. So see, if you're going to do evil and you want to do evil, you don't want your deeds to be exposed. You don't want to show how ugly they are and how bad they are. You stay in the darkness and do your evil deeds. But he who practices the truth or practices righteousness, see, he comes to the light so that his deeds may be made manifest as having been wrought in God. <clears throat> so we step into the light and let ourselves be exposed and we bring ourselves to repentance and we try to pursue righteousness and that shows this transformation of our intent and our purpose and our direction and everything else. When we step into the light, when we embrace the light with a capital L. Jesus. But those that won't believe are those that won't step into the light are those that refuse to look at and focus on the lifted up Son of Man. And so they're going to die. Notice it's just kind of layer over layer, layer upon layer. There's this concept and that concept and they're just laid over each other. But every one of them is about Jesus and why we need Jesus. Okay. By the way, see, um, see that um, verse 20, so that um, at the end of verse 20, so that his works might be rebuked or reproved or exposed. That's one of the words there that is used in 2 Timothy 4 2 about the kind of uh, preaching we're supposed to do, which proves or exposes things to be what they are. Anyway, that's another story. Okay. Give me about two seconds. I gotta, I'll be right back. Be right back. Trying to go grab two of those. Be mother chip away. You think they're gonna be done by the lunchtime? Yeah. Because you still have the dough rising. But you send that picture to us. Let us ask. Wait, who's making those? Those are the. Yeah, that's Carlos. Let's break some like really like pizza rolls. You guys realize the talk of Carla Moore's pizza rolls has been immortalized on film now. It's true. Awesome. Hey, Dan, you've got to try them, bro. I love how you said it. Not here. Yeah. Listen to this All the poor people that are listening to this recording are not going to be able to experience those pizza rolls. I'm so sorry for you. It's kind of funny. Carl's having a seizure. Just kidding. All right. Who's seizing? That's Carl. Carl. Just Carl. Pretty normal. I'm dehydrated. I'm so sorry. Have you got a cramp? Have you got a cramp, Carl? Yes. I get cramps. I get cramps in my legs at night where my, my calves and my thighs just cramp up in the back and I can't oh. even stand up and I have to get up in the middle of the night and just stand and I go get something to drink and it goes away. Sounds like a growing thing like first. Yes, you know, I I don't want to embarrass you or something. You take any supplements or anything? Potassium. Supplements? Yeah. Steroids? No. Try uh, try magnesium. And that'll help? Man, does it ever. Okay, magnesium. Yeah, probably two to 400 milligrams. And just understand that um, you're probably depleted of it. You might die. So it'll act... <laughs> It'll act like Imodium AD, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, let, so let's, don't, let's don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it'll solve that problem. All right. 
Sleep like a baby. As, as often, when you solve one problem, sometimes you create another problem. Anyway. I'm not talking about this anymore. All right. So, <laughs> in jo- this is a great recording. John chapter 3, after this whole discussion about just as Moses lifted up the serpent, why did God send his son into the world to save us? To me, you have John chapter 3, verses uh, 14 through 21 as a sort of an interlude where John, the old apostle, kind of says, listen, to this, this is the whole thing in a nutshell here. Just stay with me and I'll explain all of it later. But here it is, why Jesus came. And then he comes back to the story. See? After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And he was spending time with them and baptizing. He was immersing. Well, you know, back in chapter 1, verse, what, 30 through 31, somewhere in there, uh, John the baptizer was baptizing. And the Pharisees said, well, why are you baptizing? And he said, so that he might be made manifest to Israel. And then you have the whole story there. But now Jesus is baptizing says John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and they were coming and being baptized. So here's Jesus baptizing and John baptizing at the same time. It says, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So there was this small period of time where Jesus and John were attracting followers and preaching and baptizing at the same time. So, verse 25 says, there arose a dispute um, among the disciples of John with the Jordan about purification. Uh, Now, no wonder about purification because... Jewish ritual immersion was all about purification. And it was about becoming clean as opposed to unclean so that you could be acceptable to go offer your sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. So they're arguing about purification and how all this works. So they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, see John is their teacher, uh, He who was with you beyond the Jordan, the one to whom you have borne witness, behold, he is baptizing, and everybody is coming to him. John, we got a problem. This other guy that you were pointing us to, he's baptizing, and everybody's going to him. And John answered and said, um, No man is able to receive anything except what is given to him from heaven. Um, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. See? So he's just reiterating what he said in, in the previous discussion in chapter 1, verse 19 and following. Then he says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, see, John is the friend of the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom stands and hears, and he rejoices with great joy at the voice of the bridegroom. Uh, Therefore, my joy is made full. So um, he's saying, I'm happy people are going to see Jesus because he's the bridegroom. And I'm glad to see the bridegroom coming. And then he says very plainly, he must increase, I must decrease. Well, see, that's because the whole purpose of John coming was to point people to Jesus. Go back to um, chapter 1 and verse um, 31. I did not know him, but so that he might be made manifest to Israel, it's for this reason that I came baptizing in water. See? So John is basically telling them my purpose is being fulfilled. 
It's working. People are going to Jesus. You remember back even earlier when it was talking about the two disciples, maybe it was a little bit later, uh, the two disciples heard John speaking and they followed Jesus. That's verse 37 of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 37. They heard John speaking and they followed Jesus. See, that's the idea. So he must increase, I must decrease. So there's this comparison between the two. Jeremiah, are you lifting up your hand like the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness? Uh, I don't have any power to heal anybody, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I've kind of hit on something, and I have not noticed this before, and it's causing me a problem. Um, in Matthew, Denny explained to us about how Jesus would baptize either with the Holy Spirit or with fire. It's either going to be one or the other. Um, and, and that lends to the discussion about how John's baptism was different than Jesus' baptism because Jesus' baptism had the element of the Holy Spirit. Um, not while He was on earth. So you know where I'm going with this. Jesus is baptizing people here. Yep. I, I, I've never considered this little brief clip right here where Jesus is baptizing people. With water. Is he baptizing them into John's baptism? Yes. Or Jesus is baptizing them into John's baptism. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So, um, the baptism of the Great Commission never could happen until the death and resurrection of Jesus. But, yes, he's baptizing with John's baptism. So now John continues this comparison for the sake of his disciples. And he's talking about Jesus here. He says, he who comes from above, Anothen, is above all things. So when, you're, when you follow Jesus, you're following the one who is above all things. He who is from the earth, that's John, is from the earth and speaks from the earth. So there's the comparison. Jesus is from heaven. John is from the earth. If you go back to our discussion in the previous class, in John 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. See, that's very different than in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, and all things were made by him. But there was just this man that was sent from God, and his name was John. We'll see. John is a man from the earth. Jesus is from heaven. All right? Verse um, 31 at the end, He who comes from heaven, that's Jesus, is above all. What he has seen and heard of that, he bears witness. So he's, he's bearing witness of things that he himself has seen and heard in heaven. And no man receives his witness. It's, people are rejecting what he's telling them. He who has received his witness has set his seal to this, that God is true. In other words, if you, if you accept Jesus as witness, you're accepting the things of God. For he whom God sent, that's talking about Jesus, speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now, there's, there's a lot of people that argue over this verse. And I don't know all the intricacies of this verse. But I'll tell you what I do know. Uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is the one who has been sent from God. And when you get to chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, John chapter 20 and verse, uh, what is it, 21, Jesus says to the disciples, just as the Father sent me, even so I send you. Okay? So God sent Christ. Christ sent the apostles. And when God sent Christ, Christ spoke the words of God. When Christ sent the apostles, the apostles spoke the words of Christ. Uh, that is made quite clear 
in the Gospel of John. So, Jesus, the one sent from God, speaks the words of God. For he, now here's where people argue, and I don't know what good it does them. For he gives the Spirit without measure, and the King James adds there, unto him. Um, if you're reading King James, it says he gives the Spirit without measure, and then it says unto him. So the way the King James interprets this by adding those words is that God gives the Spirit without measure to Jesus. Okay? But, if you keep reading the Gospel of John, Jesus is the one who gives the Spirit to people who believe on Him. Um... So it's not really clear to me exactly the he, who the he is and who the uh, who's what, but I do know that the one sent from God, that's Jesus. And if I was to vote right here, and I can't prove it, but I, I can make a case for it, I would say that the he is Jesus who gives the Spirit without measure. He, he, he gives the Spirit to all people who believe on him. Now, if you go over to John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. John 7, 37 through 39. Brother Aaron, how about reading that for us? Just got to get there. Wait for it. <laughs> now, on the last day the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. All right. So you add that with what we're going to get to in chapter 4 when Jesus is at the well of Jacob and he says, hey lady, give me a drink. And Jesus says to the lady, if you knew who I was, you would ask me a drink and I'd give you living water. And Jesus said, now whoever drinks of the water in this well will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, it will become a well of water in him springing up into eternal life. And then in John 7... It says that he was talking about the Holy Spirit that those who believe on Jesus were to receive. Jesus is the giver of the living water, i.e. the Holy Spirit. So for that reason, <clears throat> I would interpret probably the last part of verse 34 as he, Jesus, gives the Spirit without measure. All right? But lest we get lost in the minutia, the important thing in the Gospel of John is the idea of sent. God sent Jesus. Jesus sent the apostles. And the word there in um, 3.34 is apostello. Apostello. And you might look and see if Denny has a copy of this or somebody... But there's an old article I wrote many years ago in the Gospel Advocate, <clears throat> and it's called God's Apostles in John's Gospel. God's Apostles in John's Gospel. And the idea is Jesus was God's apostle, and then the twelve were Jesus' apostles, because the word means to be sent out with a message. One more time, the title, Dan. God's Apostles in John's Gospel. All right. Let's take a breather here for a second. Wait a minute. <clears throat> 